Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Today is November 2nd, 1998, and we're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts, continuing with our Veterans Oral History Project. This afternoon we have the pleasure of interviewing Mr. Pandy S. Apostle. Good afternoon, Mr. Good afternoon. Apostle. How, How are you? Fine, thank you. And you? Can, I'm fine. Can I ask you a few questions about yourself and about Natick prior to going into the service? Sure. If you don't mind, could I ask you what your current age is? 81. You are 81. And your address? Natick. And how long have you lived there? I lived there first for 25 years. Then I went in the service. I came back and we lived up on Jameson Street, built a house there, then now we were on Woodland Street. So is Woodland Street the home you grew up in? No, no, Summer Street. Is you grew there. up on Summer yeah. Street. And are you currently married? Yes. Your wife's name? Thelma. Thelma. And how long have you been married? It will be 57 years in uh, December. And do you have children? We have one daughter now. We lost one daughter seven years ago. I'm sorry to, to hear cancer. that. So you have one daughter and any grandchildren? We have one grandson. Now you, where were you born? Allen Court. In Natick. Natick. And for those who might be viewing this tape, Allen Court is right behind right the behind old. Right behind the old Howard Baseball Factory, H-A-R-W-O-D. Which is right over here by the railroad station. Yeah. It's currently some apartments or condominiums. Right. Yeah, they couldn't change the exterior of it. So you grew up on Allen Court in Natick, yeah, and they, you were raised in Natick. That's right. Tell us a little bit about what Natick was like growing up. Natick was nice, and you know, this is why you say a lot of times, why is there so much dissension, or somebody calls them a name. I'm, when my parents came here in 1904, the Irish were here first, and then the Italians came, and they were called all kinds of, you know, Guinea, Wap, and that, nobody got mad. Then we Albanians came, and they were calling us Greek, Greek, dollar a week, you know. We didn't get mad. And with the Jewish people, they, you know, they call them names, you know, they call them Hebes, Kikes, nobody got mad, you know. Did you, you all know, get along? Very well. Very mm -hmm. well, yeah. So your parents came from Albania, Albania in 1904. 1904. So you grew up in a home where your parents, you were a first generation born. First generation. Mm -hmm. And did your parents speak English? No, they couldn't speak English. Mm -hmm. They were great, broken English they spoke, mm -hmm. but they worked. They both worked? Oh, no, just the wife stayed home and cooked. And did you have brothers or sisters? I had a brother, yeah. Mm -hmm. He went into the service two days before I did. And he what branch he, of the service did he, he go into? In, he was in the army. He, he and, was with OSS. And what was his name? R-A-C-H-E. And how do you pronounce that? Rachi. Rachi. <clears throat> now is he deceased or is he still alive? No, no, he's still alive, but... Okay. And living in Natick, tell us a little bit about the town itself. The town, and this is funny when you tell some people, at midnight they used to shut all the street lights. The town, they used to do that one because it would save money for the town. Sure. And uh, it was safe. It was a pleasant town because there were all sections of the town where I lived in was the Navy Island, they had Snipe Island and all names like that. But they were all mixed. I mean, there were all kinds of people there. It wasn't just, shall I say, one ethnic group or that. You know? And you, as you said earlier, you all got along well and you could well. kid each other. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about, you mentioned um, transportation into Boston. You mentioned when we were off tape. Well, mostly there were trains at first. There were trains hundreds a day going back and forth. And then they had streetcars. Streetcars street, to Boston. To Boston, yes. Route 9 was where the streetcars went. They went from downtown here and went down Harvard Street and it went down that way. They called it the Sunker Way. Came out on what is Route 9 now and up that way. Mm -hmm. Streetcars. And w did you go to the high school? Went to the high school. I went to 
the Wilson School, the original school, was where the post office is. It was a wooden building. And then from that, I went to Lincoln School, where the uh, telephone company is. Mm -hmm. And then junior high school, where the uh, senior citizens. The Coolidge oh, Junior cool, High. Yeah. And then the high school here. Which uh, is the town hall that yeah, is hall. due for demolition yeah. in another month or so. Yeah. And Lincoln School, you said where the telephone company is, is which is Grant Street, the corner of Grant uh, Street. Yeah. And it was a, a stucco building, to stucco and wood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was a smaller community back very then. Very small, yeah, very small. Um, what made you decide to go into the service? I didn't have to decide. They asked me. They asked you or told you? <laughs> told, told, told me. So you were drafted? Yeah. And what year was that? In 42. Backing up a little bit again about your family background, you mentioned earlier that your dad, your mom did a lot of baking and was a housewife a at housewife, home. Housewife, yeah. And yeah. your dad, what type of business he was he in? He in uh, shoe fact, not the factories, but in leather factories in Boston, where they would take the leather hides and make the soles for the shoes and that, or the uppers for the shoes. Were they strict parents? <clears throat> no, good parents. Good parents. Good parents. Mm -hmm. But they taught us respect for other people. This was the whole thing, you know. It's, uh, you know, you say today, why do they say, oh, get them counseling and this and that. Here were immigrant people, right from New York, couldn't speak a word of English, and yet they taught us values. That's what, you know, we respected people. Certainly. Didn't matter, you know. And growing up in a family from Albania, were you bilingual? Yes. Mm -hmm. And are you still today? Definitely. Mm -hmm. So you were drafted again, what year? 42. 1942. And what branch of the service were you drafted into? Uh, the Army. And did you um, go in with friends? Well, I went uh, through Concord because I had, I had registered in Concord. And so all these friends I knew, uh, I didn't go in at the same time when I was inducted in Concord. Then we went up to Devons and we got separated because they were going into different things and they, I wanted to go in the medics, but then they said, no, because I had been playing trumpet for 14 years. And they said, you, sh you have to go up, this is another thing, not what you want to do. You have to go up to Maine. They needed two trumpet players for the band up there. So because you had a musical background, yeah. uh, you were drafted, but they saw your talents right. and brought you to Maine. What part of Maine? Uh, Portland. Portland, Portland Maine. Maine. Yeah. Portland was a uh, coast artillery unit there. The uh, great North Atlantic Fleet of the Navy used to come in there every night when they were out. So yours is a unique situation in that you were brought in and again because of your musical background yeah. they were going to utilize you in a different capacity. Yeah. Right. What was your basic training like? Basically as anybody else did. Mm -hmm. You know they had uh, you had a, a shooter rifle so qualify you know and uh, the usual grunt stuff you know clean latrines, peel potatoes, wash floors you know and march. A lot of marching. And how long was your basic training? A month. I did a month, yeah. <laughs> and then tell us about your, your service because, as I said, this is a little unique as compared to some of the other interviews that we've done. Well, uh, as I said, a month basic training, then they sent me to the mainland, Fort Williams, which uh, that's where the band was, and it were brick barracks. Hardwood floors, we had an awful time. And, no, and uh, from then on, all it was was rehearsals, rehearsals, rehearsals. And after about a year, we started to move out to go to these different camps. We played for war bond drives, ships launchings. We played for, like we said, embarkation, sh troop ships going out, small USO shows, dances. So you were the entertainment, entertainment for part of, yeah, our yeah. soldiers and yeah. others. In fact, I was uh, when we were home when I had that 
after the month, they sent me home to Natick for a week, and my brother had come home at the same time. He had been slated for to going to the China Burma Theater. And we were home, the doorbell rang, I went downstairs with two captains from Washington, D.C. What's your name? This snack. Come upstairs, we're talking. And they were saying that they had a, uh, because I think what they thought, they were going to go through the Balkans for the war, you know. So they said, you speak Albanian, yeah. Little Italian, yes, and English. So they said, don't go back to your outfit. We'll, you know, we'll tell you where to go. And so, all right, so I escorted them downstairs, and as they were getting in the car, one of the captains said, are you married? I said, yeah. He said, we don't want married fellas. I said, well, my brother speaks the same language, just so they went out and interviewed him and took him. So that's why he got into OSS. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate, you know. Now, how old were you at this time? Phew, 42, 19, 17, 42. 25, maybe? 25 years old, yeah. and you were married. Married, I've been married, yeah. And you were married to a girl from Natick? No, she came from Albania. Mm -hmm. She came in 1938 when they had a king there, and uh, he sent her over to study the school system. She was a teacher there. But in 1939, Mussolini invaded Albania, so she couldn't go back. And that was, uh, she met me, she's a nice guy. She's just, I was good looking then. And uh, we were, you know, you may laugh about matchmaking years ago. He, this doctor friend of ours knew them and he knew us. We didn't know that he knew them or this and that. So it was, you know, meet them and that was it. So you had a matchmaker. Matchmaker, mm -hmm. matchmaker. Mm -hmm. I think we had to buy him a shirt or something. <laughs> yeah. mm. it's, uh, but as I said, uh, she couldn't speak very, very little English at that time. You know, I spoke a little Albanian, but not as, as good as I do now, you know. Now, do you um, feel that you speak the language well because of your wife? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, did your daughters learn the language also? Yes, they, they mm -hmm. both spoke the language mm -hmm. because they grew up with my mother, you know, the grandmother. And she, mm -hmm. she wasn't strict, but she made them toe the line. Sure, yeah. you know, sure. Was, so you... Trained for a year, and this was in in Maine. In Maine, yeah. And then you sort of went on the road. Diff yeah, those different uh, places. Tell us camps. a little bit about those camps. Those camps, and I've always said, I think Uncle Sam, Congressman, must have owned crappy land, so they rented it out to the army and that. <laughs> well, you know, you've been right, huh? He's laughing. Because it was not the best of circumstances? No, 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 no. Was, you, I mean, otherwise you get pampered, you wouldn't do your job, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I said, uh, when you stop and think, this wasn't a, a volunteer I'm drafted. These were ordinary fellows and girls, you know, giving back something. And that's why it tees you off when you hear about some of them, oh, this, hey, wait a minute, why do you have this? Why do we have all this stuff that we have here, you know? Mm -hmm. You have to give a little. Now, uh, when you were in, how many were in the band? We had the same 28 men in the warrant officer for almost four years, same group. You see, these fellows were National Guard. They were married, they had families, you know? Some of them had three, four kids. And uh, that was it, they became federalized. And in fact, speaking of that, at one time in 1944, uh, the government said to us, well, that's when we were going down to Arkansas, Fort Smith, Arkansas. Now, if any of you want to have your wives come down, we'll make the arrangements. And about 90% of the fellows, the wives came down, and the Army gave us duplex homes, right? And all furnished and that, right? For zero. So your and wife, my wife was, was able there three months. Mm -hmm. Because we'd come every night, we'd be home wherever we were playing for a ship launching or a USO show or a dance, we'd be home every night, so that's why. So you're able to have her with you for a yeah, while. It's a hard life, huh? While you were um, working with the band, were there any particular 
gatherings that stand out in your mind when you might have had dignitaries or something? The such? only, uh, well, with two people that stick in the mind, we played shows with Darcy Lamore up in Maine. That goes before your time. I remember and, her uh, in the movies. Eleanor Roosevelt at the Eastland Hotel. What a lady. What stuck out in your mind about her and seeing her? Eleanor Roosevelt, first of all, here's the president's wife. But then, you know, you had read about her and all that, and what a lady she was, and how smart and all that she was. You know, these are, these are the people years ago, you looked up to them. Today, it's, uh, you say, another politician, another politician's wife, so it doesn't. Do you remember her speaking at the event? No, I don't know. And Dorothy L'Amour, did you practice with her yes, as the backup had, band? <clears throat> yeah, we had a, we got the music, always got music for these shows a couple of weeks ahead of time. So when we're playing for this show, these two weeks, uh, after the shows, we rehearse the music for the next show because of different people and different, they, different acts. So you kept busy, you know, but it was a good life. It was a good life, you know. Staying with the same group of 28, yeah. did you maintain friendships? Yes, very much so. So you, after the war, you stayed in, in touch no, we, with them? No, we'd call up or write letters and that, and we'd go up to Maine and see them, because they were all from around Portland, you know? And that's why it was, uh, I think there are two of us left now. Who were some of your closest friends in the group? Who? Hmm. Uh, the top sergeant, Fred Ward, he was a fantastic guy. He liked his beer. And you know, we were, in, uh, we were up in Maine, we had the brick, brick barracks, you know. We all had a, two fellows to a room. And he'd come by seven o'clock in the morning, smashing the cymbals and saying, I don't see how anybody can sleep with all this noise going on. <laughs> but it was a good group, you know. They were very, very nice. And Good musicians. They were. Now, uh, again, before we went on camera, you mentioned that you continued to play the trumpet up until about two years ago? About two years ago, yeah, mm -hmm. with the community band, Jerry Ash. Jerry Ash's community oh, band here in Natick. Yeah, mm -hmm. fantastic guy, fantastic mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, you had mentioned prior to come on, coming on tape, December 7th, 1941. 1941. Tell us about that date. That was the day we were married, and uh, we came. We were married at the Albanian church here on Washington Street in Natick, and uh, we came out of church, and I'll never forget this because years ago there were no limousines. You didn't have, and Bertie Gruber, a Jewish friend of mine who had a furniture store out in Maynard, he had the best car. So we came out, he says they just bombed a place in Pearl Harbor. Nobody knew what Pearl Harbor was, so we went, let's go to the reception. We had it at the old Mansion Inn in Kachichiwe. This was before your time, I think, yeah. The Mansion Inn was nice. So while you're at your reception, did word spread about this bombing, and did you have a clearer picture of what was happening? Well, all they knew was place was being bombed, but whose mind was, what did they know? What did we all know, you know? Mm -hmm. What did we all know? And you were in the service for four years. Yeah. Um, give us some information on some of the other areas. It's my understanding you did you stayed within the United States. Within the United States. Tell yeah. us about some of the other places you stayed at. Or in Oklahoma and Alabama. Uh, where else? Mississippi. So for a Natick boy, was this sort of exciting for you to see other parts yes, of the yes, U.S.? Yes, it was. Yes, it mm -hmm. was. You know. And especially down south, you know, when you poverty, and, this, and it was still—I wouldn't call it racism, but there was there was that uneasy feeling about there. We used to play a lot down south, play small concerts in factories because nobody wanted to uh, work. They work three days, they make enough money, go fishing afterwards. So that's why you'd have to put on shows for them. We played for a lot of dancers in churches down there. They'd come and we'd send like five men to this place, four men to that. So everybody could, you know, could play both kinds. We could play classical, dance music, marches. We, and we used to come to, we, I'll go back. 
We were up in Maine. We used to come every Saturday to WBZ and play a one-hour concert on WBZ. On the radio on the at that radio, time. Yeah, yeah. So WBZ radio was in existence back in the 40s? Yeah, yeah. Looking back, what were some of your most memorable experiences? What memorable experiences? Even something funny that might have happened? Yes, we had, uh, we had this Armenian fella, and George was always looking to use big words, not knowing what they meant, you know. So one time we were going by train someplace, and we ate in the dining cars, you know. So I said, George, how come you didn't eat? He says, due to the deplorable conditions existing, I left my food unscathed. I says, George, unscathed has nothing to do with food. He says, it didn't do anything with it. I didn't need it. That's why he says the same thing. He was, he was a character. At one time, one of the trombone players, he wanted to be a drum, drum major. So we all said, all right, you know, so we're going to go out and practice. You know, you had a practice match. And, and we're going along, and we had fixed it between us when he twirled the baton to make a left turn. Right? He made the left turn. We just kept going straight ahead. <laughs> it was, you know, but as I said, it was, we had good times. We had good times. Now, again, you told me a few things off camera before we started the process. Tell us a little bit about what kind of health issues you went through while you were in the service and the, the difference okay. in weight between the time well, yeah, you started. Well, I, went, I went in the service. Well, I got married. I was about 200 pounds, 38-inch waist. But I was good looking. <laughs> but uh, uh, I said that when the service, and I kept losing weight. I never knew why. And I wound up going to the WAC barracks to get shirts because I was down with a 13-inch collar. And uh, I came. We were going to get discharged December 27th in 1945. So I bummed home for oh, Fort Bragg. And uh, bummed home from there. I came home, and on Christmas Day, I just flopped over. Just passed right out on the floor. And they called the family doctor. And he says, what do you got, a month off? No, no. I says, two days after Christmas, I have to be back to my Alfred, so they, they called up in Framingham, was the uh, Cushing Hospital, there was an army hospital, they were full. So then they called the Murphy General Hospital in Waltham, and uh, they sent an army ambulance down with a corps men, and uh, took me out, took me, I spent three months in the army hospital, hepatitis, I was 97 pounds. Don't ask me how I got it. They don't know. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, while you were in there, was your wife able to come in and see you? She come practically every day, mm -hmm. right from Natick to Waltham. It was bus transportation. And when were you discharged from the service then, after that? Well, I, when I got discharged from the hospital, I said, you can discharge me from the hospital. They said, no, you have to go back to your outfit. And I said, no, 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 no. Oh, no, okay. So I went back down to Fort Bragg, and I went to headquarters, and I'm saying, I'm looking for the 85th Army Ground Forces. Oh, they left two days after. I says, I know it. I says, so what am I going to do now? They said, well, you have to find a place to stay. You have to wait till we get a group that you can go with. I says, no, 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 no. I don't have to wait for a group. I says. I'm a Tech 5, a corporal. I says, you can put me in charge of myself. Can we do that? Yes, I said. So that's how it ended up. I went in charge of myself. But you know, this is the thing with the Army. They, somebody said it was this way and that way. But you have to, that's why you have to be, what's that word, a con artist when you're in the service. Get what you want. You know? So you then discharged yourself from Fort Bragg? No, 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 Fort Bragg. I was in charge of myself to go to Devons, to get discharged mm -hmm. from Devons. Fort so, Devons here in Massachusetts. Massachusetts, mm -hmm. yeah. So I spent a day there because it was all right. They, they knew the paperwork. But you have to have a complete 
suit of clothes. I said, well, I get these. Oh, no, you have to have a new set before you go out. Okay. It was, it's amazing, I'm telling you. But I'll tell you what, uh, I would never say I didn't like it or that. It was an experience, and everybody should go through it. First of all, I learned respect for somebody higher than me, you know? And you learn respect for the, all the fellows you're with. You know, you got to know them, their likes and dislikes. And, and you get to know how to hang up your clothes, how to keep yourself clean and neat, and how to keep your area clean and neat, mm -hmm. you know? But this, this is why I say, you know, I'm a, a firm believer in compulsory military training for a year. You get out of high school, and what do you, what do you know? Your first year in college is wasted. Go and do something and learn how to get along with people. Now, are you saying this just for men, or would you see it as for women also? I, uh, I don't know about, you know, forcing women. For some reason or other, I saw, I, I saw the wax and the service and the waves and all that. And uh, I feel funny. I feel a woman, not fragile, no, because they're, they're as good as anybody else. But I don't, I can't see forcing them on compulsory training for them. If they want to, I suppose. But then, of course, you have to start making all separate facilities and this and that. Once you returned from the service, you settled back in Natick. Yeah. And at what age are you now? Your late 20s at that time? Late 20s, late yeah. Late 20s. <clears throat> and what did you do then? What did I do then? I went to work as a, uh, on construction. Because at that time, in 46, factories were paying like $40 a week. And uh, on construction, this is on digging ditches and all that, putting uh, sewage pipes in that. It was $85 a week. So, you know, you had one child and you had a wife to support. And did you do construction work throughout your adult life? No, no, no. I just did three years of that. And then what? Then I got a job in the factory in Fenwall in Ashland. I stayed there 33 years. And did you retire from Fenwall? Yeah. yeah. One of the questions that we ask our um, veterans is your feelings about the difference of public opinion on the way veterans from your generation in World War II have been treated versus those who were in the Korean conflict and those who were in the Vietnam War. Would you care to comment on your feelings about that? I think, I think that they, uh, the public figured that these other wars were not, of, uh, not ours. And I mean, we went to some other countries like that. This wasn't the world conflict. And so they hold it, I think they hold it against the veterans. And yet you can't hold it against the veterans. They went there because they were told to. Mm -hmm. And this is why, you know, you say they don't realize a lot. You know, things are so good for most people. And uh, at least that's what they tell us. And uh, the thing is, you say, well, well, wait a minute. They don't know what it was, see. Maybe they didn't have a son or a daughter go and get killed in that. Unless the guy says, you've seen or it's happened to you, you don't know. And it's a shame, really, the way they're treated. Mm -hmm. Because it isn't like the movies, you know, all right, this Saving Private Ryan or whatever that movie is. See, only now people say, wow, look at that, that's how it was. Naturally, that's how it was. You know, the thing is, most all over the world is compulsory military training. And when you stop and think, we weren't ready for World War II. And, and yet, nobody complained. So a few didn't want to go on that. But I mean, 99% of them went because they figured, hey, I mean, how would uh, they have liked it if they had bombs dropping all over us? Mm -hmm. So it was their duty to go. Yeah, you felt it was a duty. And again, you feel as I owe something. You know, if you don't like it here, out, period. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a nut on that, believe me. As I said, even though I had an easy job in the Army, right? And uh, they don't realize, God, shame too, you know, it's a shame. 
Is there any one thought or memory or just a comment that you would like to leave us with this afternoon that you would share not only with your family that uh, in the future might view this tape or those who might be doing research in the future in, in reviewing this tape? No, all I, all I say is I say support any veteran, you know. Uh, go to some of the hospitals and see who these veterans are. And, and uh, forget about what they say, oh, there wasn't gas in that. They were in the hospital, something's wrong with them. It could have been your brother, your father, or your sister, or that. This is the way. You've got to look at it that way. You know, don't say, well, oh, oh what, you know, he, they became alcoholics or drugs and that. No, 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 no. Forget about that. He's a human being. Mm -hmm. God, you know. Hey. Well, we'd like to thank you this afternoon for coming in and sharing a very different story with yeah. us. This is what's been so intriguing about our taping. Everyone has a different story yeah. to tell, and we greatly appreciate your coming in. But you know, I, I felt a little ashamed to come to do this because I, of the job that I had in the service, you know, as a musician. But you gave people that were in a very difficult situation some enjoyment. Yeah, well, that's the whole thing. That's right. Thank you. Thank you.